All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, April 4th, 2011. Councilman Smith, Chairman of the Public Safety Committee. The countdown has begun. Ten more meetings. <laughs> um, if you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. Uh, my colleagues are not here, so we'll begin. Uh, the process is that um, if they show up and we have a quorum, then any item voted on after that goes to the council with a recommendation of the committee. Uh, if not, uh, the, anything that I do will go forward with the recommendation of the chair of the committee. So with that, uh, if you're here on items 1, 2, 3, 6, 11, or 12, those items will be consented and go forward to council with approval of the chair. You may leave. Get out of here before the rest of the committee gets here because I won't call it back. Uh, we will hold item 4 and 5. We understand that Mr. Cardenas has a couple of questions on 4 and 5. And we'll begin with item number eight instead of seven. Good morning, John White, City Clerk. Item eight, City Attorney Report and Ordinance, amending the LAMC to add certain requirements for door-to-door -door selling or soliciting. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning, Deputy City Attorney Brian Satelli. And uh, I'm Commander George Viegas, Office of Operations. So we, we got a final ordinance. Yes. What you have before you is an ordinance amending uh, LAMC section 4143.1 related to door-to-door -door solicitations. Um, what we tried to do is implement what the Public Safety Committee had uh, requested of our office, as you can see in the ordinance, pertaining to the particular time restrictions between they can't solicit between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, requirements that they have to show uh, identification to law enforcement or other personnel that has the duties to enforce uh, BTRCs as to who they are, and also requirements as to uh, having the BT BTRC uh, with them if they're required to do so under 2106 of the LAMC. I want to note uh, that I did receive an email later in the afternoon on Friday from a representative from the Office of Finance, that being Ed Cabrera, asking just to erase some issues in the ordinance pertaining to the BTRC. In particular, there are apparently there are individuals that are not required to have a BTRC, uh, folks that are, have been in the city less than seven days, that have doing work in the city less than seven days, and also individuals who um, are the employees of the employer. I don't think that's going to cause a problem for our ordinance because in the ordinance we say as required by 2106. So individuals that they have spoken, that they, uh, that they addressed in their email to me would not be required under 2106. So I think it would be a case-to-case -case basis unless the commission or the committee wants us to put in exceptions into the ordinance for these folks. I think as written it would be okay unless there's someone from the Office of Finance who would like to speak to that. Yes. Good morning. My name is Kathleen, and uh, I represent the Office of Finance. Um, one of the things is that uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, one of the thing is that uh, the Office of Finance staff usually um, make few, in uh, few, investig few investigation at the commercial location only. Um, what it is is that most of the solicitor they come to, they, they solicit their business usually in residential area, and we don't make field investigation at re residential area, which is not an efficient use of a time and resource of the city. And I just want the uh, committee to be aware of that. But are you? You're not going to be the enforcing agent anyway. Pardon me, sir. You won't be the enforcing agency anyway. Yeah, yeah, we're not a regulatory agency. Right. But I just want the, uh, yeah. the committee to be able okay. to well, know. Okay, I think we understand that because this was a request of the police department that yes. this came forward. So, Commander? And, and we've reviewed the uh, the ordinance as it's been written and uh, or amended, rather, and uh, we're very supportive of it. It would give us the opportunity to conduct in-field investigations uh, when it's appropriate, depending upon crime trends, patterns, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, community complaints. Yeah, I think this came forward from a situation in the Topanga Division where a couple of senior lead officers were doing field investigation of guys going door to door and found that they were staking out homes to come back and hit later on. It, it tends to be a, a, a problem that rises and, and falls depending upon the trends that are occurring, but it occurs every year. Uh, usually, in, it's almost as if to say it's season. Uh, and 
uh, for lack of a better word, we have people that are that come into the into our communities, uh, spend three or four months here, and then move on to another city and other cities, and, and continue on in terms of burglaries uh, that that they're committing, et cetera. And they're uh, alleging to be soli commercial solicitors, uh, but in reality they're not. And without this, we didn't have any um, means by which to detain. Uh, to conduct investigations as to their activities. But with this, uh, um, these amendments, we're able now to enforce this and use this as a means by which to identify individuals so that we can solve crimes or prevent crimes from occurring. Again, so with the state law, which already covers, and local law, it covers already uh, uh, charitable organizations in the same way. Now we've encompassed anyone doing door-to-door -door solicitation for commercial, commercial purposes. And anyone that goes to a door representing a government agency has to have a photo ID. So it would be safe to say to our citizens, if someone comes knocking on your door, if they don't have a legitimate photo ID issued by a government entity, you don't need to talk to them, or you shouldn't talk to them, probably, other than Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, obviously. Yeah, and I think that this has a, a uh, and I think you can speak to it, under 16 years of age or under 15 years of age. So someone's selling Girl Scout cookies, Boy Scouts, and all that at stuff. At a local high school. Or, you're, yeah. yeah. Fair. And there's a usually sense that, uh, that applies to this, yeah. obviously, that uh, uh, certainly our officers will be aware of. Yeah, I don't recall ever hearing of a, a gang of Boy Scouts going out and doing daytime burglaries, so I don't think we're at risk we, there. <laughs> we, we put the age restriction as request to the Public Safety Council, uh, Committee. Mm -hmm. It's under, eight, under 16, you don't have yeah. to show the age. Um, however, over 16, you have to show some type of identification, either by an educational institution or a governmental yeah. uh, agency. It's showing your date of birth, who you are. Very good. I, I think that the bottom line is for us to tell our constituents if someone comes to your door and doesn't have a government issued photo ID, don't talk to them. Yeah, you're just safe. Don't talk to them. That's the, the best route. So, one last question: uh, Who's going to issue these IDs? There's no identification that's going to be issued to. Well, it's different than the charitable. Uh, yeah. sections where they get an information card. Right. Here, they're going to show either their driver's license, their school ID, some type of identification that they carry on their person. We're not issuing out oh, okay. a permit to them. We're just making uh, the ability of the property owner or the law enforcement to see who they are, to identify who they are if they're doing a solicitation. Okay. For the record, for the audio record, I've been joined by Councilman Zain and uh, Cardenas, so we now have a quorum. And, uh, gentlemen, either of you have a question? D does it state on identification information that needs to be contained on that identification card other than the name and the age? Does it? Is it in the, the ordinance, ordinance? In the ordinance, uh, council member, under subsection C of 41431, it says the photo ID must include the person's date of birth and be issued by a governmental agency or educational institution. So uh, we're going we have to know who they are and, and you know how old they are. So they just can't go get a luggage tag and put their information on that. <laughs> no. And say, There's my ID. <laughs> and I want to uh, mention that this was brought to our attention. This uh, councilman Smith mentioned from some senior leads. They were very frustrated with the burglars who were using this as the guys to get access. Uh, and it was through their the conversation with us that we did the motion. And I know it's taken a while to get this around, but it shows that the senior leads have impact, and they're trying to obviously save people's property and prevent crime. So I want to acknowledge, and I forgot their names, but the senior leads that actually were very frustrated with the system, uh, I think they'll be very pleased with this. Mr. Carnes, very good. Okay, that will conclude the hearing. And if there's no objection, that goes further than unanimous consent. Thank you very much, Commander. Good seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to item four and five. And, Mr. and Carnes, we'll join you with one, two, three, six, eleven, and twelve on consent. You got it. One, two, three, six, seven, eleven, then twelve. I already dismissed them anyway, so. Oh, you did. <laughs> yeah. He dismissed them. I told him to get out of here before you showed up. Let's auction them off. All right. Item four and five. Items four and five. Item four, communication from the mayor and see a report relative to a grant in the amount of $200,182 from the L.A. County Probation Department for the Young Women's University to Resiliency Program. Item five, communication from the mayor and see a report relative to the congressionally selected grant program award in the amount of $250,000 for the Los Angeles Violence Intervention Training Academy. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. So, 
My name is Guillermo Cespedes. Thank you. And Alicia Avalos from the mayor's office. Can you start off by giving us an update on the YWAR? Hi, my name is Alicia Avalos, um, SNL director for the uh, for the mayor's grid office. Um, in terms of the, the YWAR program, as you may be aware, it was transferred to the mayor's office um, on March 2nd. Um, City Council approved the mayor's, pro mayor's proposal for the restructure of the Human Services Department. On the 22nd of April, the mayor requested authorization of the transfer of the program to the Gang Reduction Youth Development Office, which took effect as of June 1st, 2010. Um, so since transferring to the office, um, we have been working with some of the schools that are currently contracted to receive YWAR services. We have had some transition. Um, some of these, two of the staff members that had transferred over from the human services division or department um, were no longer with the office. Um, they left the office to seek um, continuing education. So we have had some staff turnover. However, we have um, been able to identify staff to continue with the program to outreach to the schools um, and to look at how we can um, update the curriculum and also really look at how we can link the program to other grid services, whether it be prevention, intervention, um, and summer night lights. Um, we've been working very closely with the probation office. Um, the MOU between county probation was signed as of November 30th, 2010. Um, and after that, we have been in the process of putting everything through the transmittal process, obviously through council. Um, so we're here today to to uh, to follow up on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now, when you talk about turnover and personnel, mm -hmm. there's, um, from my perspective, there's really two distinct uh, kinds of personnel when it comes to dealing with programs when you're literally working on the streets and in the communities. One is, I'll use my where I was trained as an engineer, there were some people that were great, great engineers, but you never want to send them out on the street because unless they're talking to other engineers, nobody understands them. So when we're dealing with young people, especially young people who have a lot of uh, um, uh, things that, that are involved in their life that we want to reach out to them and make sure we keep them in school, we keep them on the right track and they don't fall away from that. Um, how are you doing when it comes to being able to identify the kinds of folks that the kids can relate to? We've um We've been able to do that in terms of identifying staff that previously worked um, in the office through YWAR. So when YWAR was transferred to the mayor's office, there were two positions that were available that were part-time positions. Um, we were able to identify a staff member who has a background in social work, um, who also has direct experience in working with youth prior to coming to the mayor's office, um, working with youth in different transitional facilities. Um, so she has been able to um, take on the program and will be the program facilitator. So she does have direct experience working within the grid office and working specifically within the YWAR program. So specifically, this is what you would call a gender-specific program. This person is specifically used to working directly with young girls. Yes. Okay, or young women. Young women. Mm -hmm. well, I have questions on five, but we're on four. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, well, keep up the good work. I know that that uh, YWAR uh, had more staff at one time. It had more funding. We were covering more uh, young people, young women, uh, for for many years, and it's a great program. One of the things that I'd like to do, Mr. Chairman, and I'm just going to be asking this every time I see an item, um, for us to start giving at least a five or six year running a tally of a program that has any history, if it's not brand new, how were we funding it five years ago, six years ago? And then on top of that, a mixture of what kind of full-time dedication personnel or part-time personnel we were running it with. Because unfortunately, what we have is many, many programs that still exist there's a much, much more work out there to do than we're fortifying ourselves to do it with. However, um, we have a lot of wonderful people who are really holding things together, doing it with minimal funding, minimal staff. Uh, people that <clears throat> normally should be out in the field are probably typing up their own reports and doing everything else <laughs> under the sun. Uh, it, from my opinion, that's not the most efficient way to do things, but unfortunately, we find ourselves that that's, in some cases, that's the only way that we're going to be able to continue, is to ask more and more of, of, of people who are dedicated and uh, who are actually doing more. So um, if you could get them on the next time you and I sure. sit down, if we could just go over that, I'd sure. really appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, uh, questions on, on item five. Um, one thing I'd like to do is just thank you, Guillermo, and, and, and the mayor's team for uh, working with uh, 
La Vida, as we call it, L, uh, Los Angeles Violence Intervention Training Academy, uh, which is the first of its kind that we're aware of in the right. country. Correct. Perhaps the first of its kind in the world. Uh, maybe if there are others in the world, maybe we'll have an international conference here uh, because we could always learn more uh, from each other, and especially if we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But it is uh, a one-of-a-kind opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right now in Los Angeles, it appears that we have two organizations that are uh, dedicated to training uh, in one way or another uh, interventionists and getting them to uh, be able to be professionals in many sense of the right. word. They're already, uh, they're already professionals, but it's one thing to know what you're doing on the streets, another thing to know how to interact with government, Correct. how to interact with the police department, which all of them do and, and should do. Um, now, on that note, um, first of all, once again, I just want to thank you for all the wonderful work that's been going on. And, and I'm actually part of uh, the uh, one of the oversight committees that actually has an opinion or, or gets information, and we discuss what we can do better, what's been going on well, et cetera. So I'm, I'm very happy to be involved with that, and thank you for the opportunity, Chairman, uh, to be a part of that. So with that, in 2009, uh, <clears throat> I introduced the motion asking that the city or the mayor's office try to consider how we can uh, perhaps create an independent uh, certifying board that could possibly figure out how and if we should be grandfathering some interventionists who are obviously, uh, shall I say, senior interventionists with Correct. reputation and the ability to, to uh, not only be out there in the community, but perhaps even to teach uh, future interventionists. How's that uh, coming along? Are we able to make any inroads with that? Where is that? Well, we have. We have. Um, the academy has developed with, in collaboration with GRID, a grandfather clause um, in which seasoned intervention workers have applied to be grandfathered in. That grandfather clause is based on intervention workers who have had experience with the 12 prong one um, work activities um, that, or the framework of work from the 12 prong, the 12 activities of prong one of the ad hoc committee framework that was developed. Those intervention workers have applied to be grandfathered in. Their applications have been accepted. There has not been a formal action taken yet, but that is moving forward. Um, what, what, what would be the, the trigger or the ability to take formal action? Are we still trying to figure out how we can formalize and document that grandfathering? Uh, no, I it think is a it's a delicate matter because it is a delicate and the reason matter. why I say it's delicate, it's not delicate in the sense of knowing who uh, really fits that mold of being able to be grandfathered. But the last thing I'm sure you or any of us want to be involved in is for somebody to try to put criticism on some of those folks, being that just because we like them or just mm -hmm. because we know them, we grandfather them. And, and that is not the case. That's never the case. So That is um, not the what, case. How, how are things coming as far as being able to to uh, identify what elements we're going to be able to document before we grandfather people. Well, the elements are their experience with practice is documented both by their statements and collaborating parties, whether it be agencies, law enforcement, other community members. I think the issue with, you know, finally moving forward with saying you have been grandfathered through this um, has been a question of time. Um, as you know, the resources for the academy are minimal to do this massive project. So, um, and the timeline by which that decision will be made, I think that's a question that might be best answered directly by the academy. Okay. And um, so, right now we have uh, La Vita is is formally working with the city. Uh, Correct. When it comes to their training. Correct. And there's also another organization in town that, that has been doing training. As a matter of fact, has a lot of experience training Correct. Uh, people with the fire department Correct. on how to uh, deal with first responders. It, a lot of people don't realize it, but when there's a shooting, most of the time, especially in the inner cities of, of this country, the first responders sometimes are people who are from the fire department, paramedics, etc. They're first on the scene before the police are there. Uh, not because the police aren't trying to get there quickly, but because when 911 is called and they say that somebody is dying or somebody has been shot, uh, what happens is they're responding as the police are responding. So for them to, to know how to deal with a hot situation like that, uh, they're not armed, nor, nor, nor are we saying they should be, but they're obviously in a situation where there's a lot of emotion and a lot going on and they're trying to do their job. 
So how's it going with that other organization? Well, the, the collaboration between my office and the other organization is actually through the funding body that funds that organization at Better LA. Mm -hmm. So Brian Center and I have had a series of meetings looking at how, do the, how are the models similar, the models of practice on the street. The issue with the, you know, the, the other academy is that primarily La Vida is training intervention workers that have a contract with agencies that are contracted by, by the city. Um, so there are various groups of intervention workers on the streets and as I stated before, the more intervention workers we have the better. The question is one of resources, so Brian and I have been in communication about us to sharing information back and forth and how do the models of practice develop in a similar way. So uh, I just want to make sure people understand when you say more intervention is the better, but it's not more intervention is the better more trained, regardless of the quality. More quality trained. interventionist, and correct. there are a lot of good quality interventionists. That's correct. As a matter of fact, to be an interventionist, uh, there's some things you just can't learn in a classroom in order for you to be an correct. effective interventionist. So the training has a lot to do with uh, understanding protocols and processes and uni correct. creating uniform protocols but the training in some ways can't legitimize somebody's ability to be that is uh, on the streets and have that street credibility. That is correct. I think that the main difference to date is that my staff responds on the ground with great uh, intervention workers that are con contracted to great agencies, so we do get direct field experience evaluation of what they're doing. We, are not, we have not been able to do that citywide. It's just a staffing problem to get on the streets with every gang intervention worker that's out there. So the good thing is what you're saying, Guillermo, is that we do have models. We do have a much, much better understanding today as to what works. Uh, at the same time, unfortunately, resources is, is our limiting factor. Maybe. Correct. And I believe, um, if I'm correct, your staff and I have been discussing, setting up a meeting with you to discuss specifically the issue of models, those models that are across the country, and what do we pull from those models to enhance what LA is doing. Um, that is the great development, that intervention isn't one thing anymore, that there are various models that, um, that are being used, that there's an evaluation in place, and that um, I think we're really moving forward with intervention as a whole. Um, the issue of resources, as you know, we still need more resources to do more of the work. Uh, a Better LA um, was uh, very closely associated, and I'm sure still associated with a former USC coach. Any current USC coaches involved with Better LA that you're aware of? Uh, <laughs> that I don't know, sir. <laughs> but the good thing is that, that uh, the daughter of a former coach is still very, very much involved Correct. here in Los Angeles. Correct. And, and a Better LA is very uh, alive and well and, and doing well. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, to point out that even though there are personnel changes, even though some uh, people might change their, their direct involvement or what have you, there's still a great amount of infrastructure, thank God, and a great amount of dedication uh, involved in making sure that we continue to be. Uh, and I, I think we should be proud to say that I think that Los Angeles is the model for solution-based intervention and prevention programs. Unfortunately, um, we're not the model of how much money we can put into it, but we certainly are the model for continuing to create best practices and being honest with ourselves and changing what works and continuing that and changing what doesn't work and, 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 and uh, not continuing to do that. From my point of view, that's the exciting thing that is happening in the field right now in L.A., that we are, in fact, fine-tuning what models are and what what benchmarks should be measured and what is effective and those kinds of things. We've come really a long way in doing that and some of that has been built on the work that has been done before. So it is an exciting time. As you said, we do need more resources to do the work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? All right. Mr. Curtis, you move those items in? Yep. Those items are moved, approved, sent forward. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll talk to Lane Kiffin for you when I get a chance. <laughs> yeah. Item number seven. Item I'm seven. Sure City attorney report an ordinance amending the LAMC to increase penalties for late renewal of alarm permits. <coughs> no gang activity this morning. <laughs> Good morning, Good morning. committee. Uh, 
members of Richard T. Fank, Executive Director of the Board of Police Commissioners. Uh, the item before you is uh, to increase the uh, amount of penalty for a false alarm, excuse me, for an alarm uh, permit which is renewed late. Currently, the penalty is uh, $10 and $15. What this ordinance will do uh, is to increase the amount of late fee for a permit that is renewed after January 1st but before March 31st to half of the current fee, which is $34, it would be $17. After March 31st, it would be a full 100 percent, increasing it to $68. Uh, this is a re recommendation that came through a number of committees over the past year. I believe the uh, Audit and Government Efficiency Committee also recommended it. It's before you to uh, to correct the uh, the low amount of fee we had before. What we did, we chose the 50 and 100 percent. That way, every year when we adjust the alarm permit fee, we don't have to come back and amend the ordinance. It just remains 50 and 100 percent. That concludes my report. Answer any questions you may have, sir. Yeah, I have one question. Um, what happens to somebody who either disconnects their alarm system or doesn't want to continue it or moves, and it goes to this default then for penalties? Is there a mechanism for them to drop out before it goes to penalties? Or once it goes to penalties and late fees, is that something we're going to carry on our books that this press is going to come back a year or two from now saying you've got $5 million of uncollectibles when we know we'll never collect those kind of monies? The way it would work currently is if you have a alarm permit for 2011, uh, a renewal for 2012 will get mailed out to you November 1 of 2012. If you do not renew, there's no renewal, therefore there's no debt that we're carrying. That permit would just expire. If you renewed it after March 31st, instead of it being $34, you would pay $68. The permit itself is not carried as a as a collectible debt on behalf of the city, only a false alarm fine. Just false alarms? Yes, sir. Okay. N not the permit. Not the permit itself. All right. Very good. Ms. What type of compliance do we have now with the alarm permits? Uh, right currently, as of uh, April 1st, we have 131,300 alarm permits issued through the city. In 2010, we had 42,381 false alarms. Of that, uh, 14,977, or 35%, did not have an alarm permit. Uh, we are getting good cooperation from the alarm companies when they are selling new alarms because they are required to have that person have a, an alarm permit or facilitate them getting a permit. Where we are seeing the delinquency in not having a permit is for those persons who have had an alarm for a long time, they get their first false alarm. When we send the bill, we, we obviously see through our system they don't have a permit. And when you don't have a permit, it's an additional $100 penalty. So that currently is $149. So for your false, first false alarm, be $149 plus $100, $249, plus you would have to get the permit for $34. Okay, why can't we compel the alarm companies that receive that call, that send it to the 911 center, why can't we compel those alarm companies to make sure that those folks are inform them about the permit? We work with the alarm companies for them to distribute that to their subscribers. When a person does get that 911, we get a 911 call from an alarm center and they don't have a permit, that starts the process to send the billing to get a permit. Under our new tracking system, we are able to do that and we generate the bill, the additional $100 for the false alarm, right. along with that, requests. How many folks do we estimate now don't have alarms? Don't I, have permits, I should say. I could not give you that number, sir, because uh, we don't know that until we get a false we, alarm. Why can't we cross-reference that with the alarm companies? They know their subscribers, so why can't we cross-reference that and then have compliance? They're, they protect the confidentiality of their alarm data, and, and we cannot require them to give it to us. We work cooperatively with them to get that information because we want to ensure the alarm is a, a good, reliable alarm. Right. And as I said, uh, you know, last fiscal year, excuse me, last calendar year, 35 percent of the false alarms did not have a permit. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of people. It, it, it is. And, and again, you'll have to remember, sir, that a number of folks have had alarms for a long time, never had a, never had a false alarm. So that would be the first time we have contact with them. What we are seeing uh, since the new ordinance came into place about two years ago, requiring an alarm permit for the installation of an alarm, significant compliance with that. Very, very good compliance. You, you can have an alarm that's not hooked up to an alarm company that's just an audible. That's correct. And your neighbors may call the police. That's correct. And we'll How never know that, about where that. Where does that fall? Does that fall anywhere? Uh, if you have an audible not hooked up to a company, it activates, 
the neighbor calls 911, right, my neighbor's alarm went off, are they then required to have a permit also? Yes, they would if we responded to that call as a false alarm. Okay. We would not normally respond to that as a dispatch call because we only respond to those calls that come through an alarm center. Right. However, if your neighbor called and we responded, discovered you had an alarm, it was a false alarm with no permit, then you would be required to have a permit, the $149 plus the $100 penalty. Have we ever estimated how many of those folks there are that don't hook up to alarm company but have an alarm? I can't give you that number, sir. Again, it's one of those moving targets. We've uh, attempted to get that information through alarm companies long prior to my arriving uh, in my current position. As you recall, back in 2002 when there was the, the initial effort to have a non-response policy and then that began a lot of task force work together. In 2003, there was some resolution to those issues. So I, I think where we are currently, though, we're, we're in a pretty good place because we have seen uh, false alarms, uh, again, in, two, in 2010, we had 42,381 false alarms. As recently as five years ago, we were over 100,000 false alarms. Uh, we had a reduction uh, from 2009 of 3,160 false alarms in 2010. So I think we're doing a good job in, in utilizing our resources appropriately, so we're not responding to false alarms. But when we do respond under our new billing and collection system, we have seen an increase of from 53% collection to 75% collection. Hey, and that's my final question on collection. Who does the collection? Collection is done by the Office of Finance. We do the billing out of uh, the Commission Investigation Division. And if, under someone, and if someone doesn't pay, what ha what's the consequences? They don't pay, then it goes to collection. We have 45 days. If they don't pay within 45 days under the mayor's directive, it's referred to collection automatically. So we're pursuing that. Oh, absolutely, sir. We, we have a, a process every month. Bills are, are referred to collection on an ongoing basis. Okay. Thank you. So if somebody doesn't have a permit, it's an additional $100 um, penalty? Yes, sir. That's correct. If we respond to an alarm and they don't have a permit. Now, when it comes to the late fees, there's a late fee on the initial you don't have an alarm permit, $100? No, sir. The way it would work currently, uh, let's separate them out. You have a permit. Uh, we respond to your first false alarm, that's $149. If you do not have a permit and we respond, it's $149 for the response, a $100 penalty because of no alarm permit, and then you must get an alarm permit. But there would be no late penalty on that alarm permit. Okay. All right. And also, um, I just want to clarify for the record that this element of raising of the, the penalties, et cetera, and, the, and fees and, and that nature, it's not that we want to make a profit off of a call. The bottom line is it's the cost of doing business. We're talking about having at least one squad car show up to a property ready to protect and serve. And if it's a false alarm, that took those officers away from perhaps something else that might be happening in their jurisdiction that they're not at that location. So the bottom line is it's time and materials. Uh, I mean, even though we're government, it's still time and materials. And, you know, that squad car can't be in two places at once. And certainly uh, they want to be where they need to be, not where it's a false situation. That's correct, sir. It's a special service fee. It's only cost recovery. And every year we do a, a computation of those costs based on salary, benefit rate, time it takes for each individual who is involved in that process. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. I have two follow-up questions, one for the department. Used to be, uh, and I don't know what it is currently, but it used to be uh, when you responded to a code 30 call on your MDT or whatever it's called, MDC, what is it now? M MDC. Now, it would say no permit on file. But there was no checkbox on the card the officer would leave at the door saying a false alarm. Is there a checkbox or should we put a checkbox on the responding officer's card that they leave at the house saying we do not see a a uh, valid permit on file, you must, in big bold letters, get a police permit. We have that information on the current slips that are supposed to be left by it the It is officer. on the doors. Okay. Yes, sir, it is. And, and then again, we would track that through our system and generate to the individual an automatic application yeah. for an alarm. I know at that end it was done, but years ago we didn't have that on the, on the card. So Council Member Zine, about three years or so ago, uh, gave us a, a, an alarm slip from, I forget, I think it was Hermosa Beach or Manhattan Beach, one of the beach cities, and we tailored that to, uh, to our specific that needs. That way at least the person knows that someone showed up. Exactly, yeah. sir. Then <laughs> one other, and i Ms. Carney have a question. Uh, for the city attorney, you, you, and it's, I remember the discussion years ago that we couldn't get information from the alarm companies. They consider that proprietary information of 
who their subscribers are. However, they're the person generating the phone call. Could we, in a way, find them for making a false call? So it kind of puts them on their back in a different way. But the person, I'm sorry, Brian Satelli, uh, Deputy City Attorney. You're saying the person that makes the phone call, the neighbor making no, no. the phone call? No, no. When the, when the false alarm activation goes off in a home, it's the, the alarm company making the phone call to 911, not if, the city. Right. Assuming they have a right. permit. If they subscribe. That's going to be 99% of the people. They, that company may not know that this person doesn't have an alarm permit. Right? They, they will know that, sir. They're supposed to have a permit the time they get the service now. And that's the that's at the time they get the service. Correct. Year two, year three, unless they're keeping an active tracking system, they don't know that Greg Smith's alarm two years ago had a permit but no longer has a valid permit. That, that would so they're calling 911 on my behalf. Officers come out. They see there's not an active permit on file. We go through an entire process where we got to now go find the citizen for the alarm. But really, to keep the alarm companies proactive and keeping those alarms valid should fall on their back. But we can't because we can't cross-reference, as Mr. Zion was trying to get to. They won't give us that information. In another way, we could force them to do it by saying, you're liable now for a bad phone call if you make the call, because you're making the call to, to 911. I'm happy to arrest him. <laughs> <laughs> He's dying to arrest somebody. <laughs> So in a in kind of a de facto way, could we put the pressure back on them by making them responsible for making the bad phone call? Well, that's something I'm not prepared to respond to you now, but uh, it's kind of like a vicarious liability because the yeah. uh, property owner is um, delinquent yeah. to, to go against the carrier. And it's their I, client. I, I mean, they bear the responsibility of the phone call. It's their client. They're involved in the process. Yeah. We make them responsible at the front end, but we don't make them continually responsible. So this might be a vicarious way or a backdoor way to make them bear responsibility because they won't give us the list. Okay, well, we'll do it a different way then. So what I'd like you to do is look into that, see if there's any other best practices out there, other cities that may do something like that. It will give us a, a, a different way to approach it. We'll go forward with this today, uh, but uh, maybe for a future we could take a look at that. Mr. Cardins? We'll have Mitch follow up on that. <laughs> That's a good idea. Mitch is going to do it? <laughs> I'll get him a booster chair. Get him a booster chair. When it comes to a fault, you mentioned the number of false alarms, false alarm rate. Yes, sir. Um, so what came to mind is, do, does the department or associations of police uh, associations, do they – uh, share information as to what their percentage false alarm rate is per 10,000 alarms or what have you. They do? Yes. How sir. do we stack there? Uh, currently, uh, nationwide, the, the uh, numbers, 97% of the alarms are false. Uh, our rate last year was 83%. We have seen a decrease in, in our numbers of false alarm rates. I think the reason for that is uh, with the uh, installation in July of 2009 of our new management system, uh, we have great data now because the there's an interface between the false alarm permit database with the computer aided di dispatch database that the, the dispatchers use in communication center so when that call comes in from the alarm monitoring center immediately the dispatcher can see on his or her screen whether it's a permitted location and the number of past false alarms at that location in the past 365 days under our current policy if there have been more than two in the past 365 days, two false alarms, the call is what is called a broadcast and file. It is not assigned to a unit. If a unit does not pick up the call, that person is not billed because we don't respond. If a unit does pick up the call and we respond, then that would be billed as a false alarm. So what we are seeing is a better management of our resources. So we are not, quote unquote, wasting the officer's time going to all these false alarms. And we're also increasing for the officer's own officer safety knowledge that the potential for this to be a good alarm is higher. Be aware, be careful, because certainly uh, we all know that as you would go to these locations that have 10, 15, 20 false alarms, that's oh, just another false alarm at Joe's Hardware. And you get there and it could be a, a good alarm and you get yourself in a, in a situation that would be, be safe for you. So I think we, we have done a good job in, in lowering that rate. Th thank you very much. Uh, it's good to hear that we're, we're making improvements that perhaps other jurisdictions 
haven't gotten around to. So again, we're, we're leading the way, it sounds like, um, certainly for big cities. However, um, is it possible for um, the department to get us a report of the number of alarm permits per zip code? I think we can do that, but or, I, I, or, I, I, I can't. Jurisdiction of, of, you know, of some sort, some Within category. council districts of, or by, by. How about for reporting districts? RDs, yeah. I, I, uh, there, there's a way we can do the sort. Uh, the, the alarm permit uh, is generated through the Office of Finance. We have the data within our system. I believe we can. I'll, I'll, I'll check into that, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move that further with the recommendation of the committee. Thank you very much. And next item is nine. Item nine, city attorney report and ordinance amending the LAMC to require official police garage operators to remit fees on the 15th and last day of each month. This is a continuation of the discussion we had a few months back. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, again, Richard T. Fank, executive director of the Board of Police Commissioners. I'm joined by Detective Ben Jones, who is our coordinator of official police garages, and Lieutenant Chris Waters, who is our new commanding officer of Commission Investigation Division. Chris comes to us from Operation South Bureau, where she was the adjunct to the deputy chief. So uh, she is getting her feet wet in this process. Before you is a, a request to modify the current uh, uh, city ordinance, which would allow for electronic reporting of the fees that official police garages remit to the city. Under the current uh, ordinance, they remit the fees at the end of each quarter, with the exception of the parking occupancy tax, which is remitted every 30 days. So for the quarter of um, uh, March, April, May, excuse me, uh, January, February, March, the fees would be sent to us by the end of April. What this will do is require the OPGs to submit the fees every 15 days. What that does for us, it does not give us any additional revenues, but it moves revenues into the fiscal year to have cash on hand to spend. So the revenues for the period of April 15, April 30, May 15, May 31, and June 15 would be included in the fiscal year revenues. And those under our, our current uh, uh, activity level by the OPG in this fiscal year would be about 2.7 million. So it would be a, an infusion of $2.7 million into the fiscal year in cash to spend. It would not increase the overall fees that we receive. So this is bringing forward, and we've worked with the Office of Finance, Official Police Garage Association, to implement this. And it also does uh, unify through all of the various categories that they're required to submit the fees, a 25% penalty if those fees are not submitted within 15 days of the due date. Uh, we already had this discussion. As I recall, the, the, the operators are already willing to do that and are doing it now already. They're ready to begin immediately. They're ready to begin. Yes, sir. Okay, so we got to move this quickly. Um, has the CAO calculated that money into the department balance for this fiscal year? In our we have provided the information. Whether they have or not, I can't. I can't respond. Is it in the mid-year FSR? Yes, Senator May, you turn from the CAO. Yes, that was part of the operational plan, so we did put that into the revenue for this fiscal okay. year. That's good and bad. I was hoping it wasn't, because <laughs> then we had some extra money, but it's already counted. What the heck? It's um, Yes, yeah, so it, the last time I remember this discussion, the industry folk that are forwarding uh, those dollars by this, the 15th, that they were okay with the penalty as well. They understand. Yes, sir. That's that's the penalty, and they're ready, willing, and able to comply. That is okay. correct, Thank sir. You. Now, was this your idea? It was all of our idea. No, I, I, nobody nobody I, claims credit you for can it. You take credit for it. I remember <laughs> no, our discussion. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, it, it was all of our thought process. Somebody, but I mean, the, you folks. In the, yes, it, it, it came about from our staff. Absolutely. And, and again, the reason for this is, uh, let's just take. The lieutenant got here. Uh, uh, let, yeah, more ideas. Let, let, let's take the vehicle uh, release fee. The vehicle, vehicle release three, fee through the end of February was $7 million. So that money is held in trust by the OPGs for 90 days. And that's collected on behalf of the city, $115 per car released. That's our cash. Let's get our money. And so basically this process will get our cash into our hands quicker so we have cash available. Great idea. You're going to give me a helicopter ride? We'll give you a helicopter. <laughs> Were you at that event? I was, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I saw you perform. <laughs> it was a performance. I'm, I'm expecting a council motion on the funds that are being yeah. spent. Yeah, he, he came over and said, we made $15,000. I said, you spent 20000 to make it. But that's okay. I don't, thank you very much. That goes for the committee. Right. And can we get that through quickly so make sure that's in the uh, 
The ordinance since it involves fees does require a notice of publication that will be able to go to council in about two weeks. Let's move it along as quick as possible so that we get that cycle started. We have worked with the city attorney and the vendors are voluntarily going to do this, and we work with the Office of Finance, so we'll be moving forward April 15th in a voluntary capacity. Because they can do it voluntarily because it's on or before it right now, right? Absolutely, sir. They're not required to wait 90 days. That's correct. Thank you. Item number 10. Item 10, Board of Police Commissioners and CA reports relative to the Narcotics Analysis Laboratory Trust Fund Expenditure Plan number 15. Good morning, Anna May Uten from the CAO. The report before you requests approval of the Narcotics Analysis Laboratory Trust Fund Expenditure Plan number 15. The expenditure plan covers training in 2010-11. As proposed, the LAPD will be using $200,000 for personal training. In addition, approval to consolidate remaining balances of $78,000 into the current fund to pay for, actually to reimburse the revolving training fund for travel and training costs associated with staff training. And the list is here, but that can be changed at any time, the list of the training options, right? That's a lot of training. Any questions? Sounds good to me. You see the long list of training? Is there anything you can go to? There's a lot of stuff I can go to. All right. If there are no questions, we'll move this forward to the Recommendation Committee. Thank you very much. That concludes today's agenda. Is that correct, Mr. White? It does. Seeing no further cards and no one is wishing to speak to the committee on item not on the agenda today, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Nice job, Mr. Chairman. Just for the public record, also, I had heard from Detective Edo that Officer Jenkins, who was shot this morning, a Metro Division officer, is in critical condition but guarded at Holy Cross Hospital, and that's an upgrade from where he was a few hours ago. So our wishes are with him in the department. Is the suspect in custody yet? No. Okay. The suspect is still hanging out there.